Weight loss has got us into this mess. Weight management through exercise and diet change is going to be our way out of it. Welcome to this week's Escape Your Limits podcast. Today, we're speaking with one of America's leading health educators and exercise physiologists. Physical activity is more important now than ever, and experts like our guest today agree that gyms are in fact essential. So with 35 years of experience in the fields of fitness, medicine, and health promotion, he reveals what you need to do to remain an essential business and avoid closing. So this is your chance to learn how your gym can increase its value and cash in on revenue opportunities by providing holistic solutions to your members. So please welcome the founder and president of Medical Health and Fitness, Mr. Eric Duak, to the Escape Your Limits podcast. You you asked me, how did we get here? And I said, Krispy Kreme, McDonald's, uh, Dairy Queen. You know, uh, uh, my grandmother during World War II uh, worked in a canning factory in mid-Michigan. And she was five feet tall. She weighed about 160 pounds. She was kind of heavy set Czechoslovakian woman anyway. But every day Brock's Candy gave them free bags for lunch because they wanted to help the war effort. Well, she gained 40 pounds, had diabetes, and died of a stroke in her 80s. So again, how did we get here? She didn't know. She was an immigrant from, from the old country. She killed her own chickens. She ate her own eggs. She mostly did pretty good. She grew her own vegetables. She had the best compost pile I ever saw in my life. But her problem started when she was in her 30s and she was eating over three or four years yeah. the Brock's candy. And they were only trying to help. Thank you for supporting the Escape Your Limits podcast. If you're thinking about creating a unique and engaging fitness space to take your fitness to the next level, then we have you covered. Escape Fitness design and manufacture some of the most innovative, attractive, and durable functional training and free weight equipment used by many of the best trainers and fitness brands across the globe. As a valued listener, we are offering you a 10% discount off many of the products on our website. You can check out the full range by going to escapefitness.com and use the code DUMBBELL. That's escapefitness.com using the code DUMBBELL. That's it for me. Please enjoy the rest of this interview. Well, Eric, thank you for joining us here in Newport Beach. I hope it wasn't too painful to come and, uh, you know, come to the sun. And, uh... Oh, well, uh, <laughs> we, had, we had good traffic from Los Angeles, from Santa Barbara to L.A., and um, we stayed in Rancho Palos Verdes, which is not a bad place to be. It was a beautiful location, and we got here right, right on time. So I've been really lucky with the L.A. traffic. So I'm, I'm, I'm not down here enough but this was this was a good ride and i'm actually going back up to irvine because i have business colleagues and i'm having lunch with some some college track buddies uh who are big investment guys uh in irvine now and um so yeah it's it's, this is gonna be a fun day and i'm gonna end the day uh i'm gonna be at um uh there's a place here in orange county that you may want to check out someday it's called hyperion motors right it's a hypercar company and the owner of the company uh, went to College of Creative Studies in Detroit, which is where my son studies. And my son wants to design hypercars, you know, like wow, Lam- nice Lamborghinis yeah. and Koenigseggs and these, million, <laughs> these $4 million cars. That's what his forte is. So anyway, uh, I'm going to go there and just do a little recon for him. Beautiful car. It's, it's, wow. a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hydrogen slash battery car. It's amazing. So. You should have told me before that we could have gone there before, before doing the interview. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So, so look, thanks. It was, well, thanks um, for having me here. I just want to say that, you know, this is, I, I told people that you're like the Joe Rogan of the fitness industry. Oh, right. That's a compliment. <laughs> well, it is because that guy, you guys have the same hairstyle, yeah. but he's just such an engaging interviewer and personality. I mean, he was an MMA guy, what did, you know, but he just, he found his niche. Yeah. And I think that this is kind of your niche as well, too. Yeah. I mean, you, you've had some really cool people on this show. Yeah. And I'm happy to be here. I mean, I, this is, I think this is a, you know, a, a Malcolm Gladwell talks about the tipping point. This, this, I think because I'm doing a, you know, reflux of my career, I think that uh, this is a tipping point. Because, yeah. you know, you have a lot of followers. You have a lot of people in the industry know who you are because of this podcast. So this is, this is a good deal. Well, I, so, I was pleased that we, we managed to connect. I think it was through LinkedIn and, um, you know, the... We, we, we spent quite a lot of time talking and I was trying to absorb because there was, you, there was so much that you've been involved with. You know, it was quite <laughs> overwhelming. I've got, I've got the documents. And I'm like, okay, I need to make some time to really sort of get my head around this and what you're doing. And, and um, I, I think to, you know, I kind of, to summarize, I think, you know, and you mentioned this as well, it's, you know, tr- how, can we, how can we make gyms essential, I guess, is, is, is sort of 
the way I boiled down a lot of yeah. um, what we had, and, and particularly as it relates to a lot of the audience that, that listens to here, because the major- not all, but the majority of people have been closed down. And, and I suppose when you look at, at and, and we had the conversation with the, the gentleman from Self Made a couple of days ago, you know, if you think about what's going on and, and a lot of the issues, and um, you know, gyms and fitness and health seem to be like the most important thing at the moment that that should be kind of part of solving the issue that we're in. Right. Um, and yet it's, it's for different reasons, I kind of get it, but, but it's, it's, you know, you, you, there's, there's all these essential businesses, particularly in California, you know, you've got pot shops and you've got, you know, um, what is it called? Botox centers yeah. and, yeah. and all these things. Well, there's a, there's a strip club in San Diego that's been deemed an essential business. So right. Go figure that. Yeah. So you kind of got all these things and then you've got something that seems, and I, and I'm, I'm not an expert, at all, but it, it seems as though you know done correctly, this could make such a big difference um, to you know preventing people from sort of you know I've had COVID and um, preventing them from sort of getting it really really bad, right. um, and uh, you know and, and also once people have had it you know kind of getting them back on track and getting them healthy because there is a bit of a, a recovery period once you've had it mm-hmm. and you know I, I sort of took some advice and I, I, I managed to sort of get over it pretty well, but. Um, you know, I'm in the industry and I've got connection with some of the best people in the world, I suppose. So what does the average person do? So mm-hmm. anyway, I, I, I think that, you know, the, the essence of what you were talking about, I think there's some real value there. And, um, and I, you know, I thought it was really worth sort of sharing and, and getting inside your head. Well, I was one of the most fortunate people, I think, in the industry is that when I was in New York City, I was asked to come out to Santa Barbara to do research in this famous medical research center, uh, the, the Sansom Medical Research Institute which was named after William Sansom, who in 1931 was the first American physician to administer insulin to a patient. He's famous in the diabetes field. I mean, this is, William Sansom is like Banting and Best in Toronto. He's one of the top guys in history of, of the profession. And here I am working with a woman named Lois Yovanovitch, who was considered the world's leading authority in the management of gestational diabetes and pregnancy. And Chuck Peterson, who came from the Rockefeller Institute, and it literally one of these people are, they're the smartest people in the world at what they do. And her office was right next to my gym. I mean, I could sit down with these people every single hmm. day, Matthew, and talk about immunology, talk about infectious disease, because the AIDS virus was sort of a big deal when we were there. But they would pick my brain about things that I, I brought a very interesting perspective to a medical research center. What was your he, perspective? Well, like metabolic scaling. Uh, which was a topic that nobody really cares about. But when you look at the hummingbird heart rate versus the, the, the elephant heart rate, you see these two different metabolic beasts. And I say, well, wait a minute. Well, let's apply that to aerobic training versus strength training. And let's look at the heart. When you have an aerobic marathon guy or a guy like Michael Shermer, who, was the, who I talked about with the Lance Armstrong, he's got a larger heart. Lance Armstrong had a larger heart. So it, it, it ejects more, a, vo- a higher volume of blood in each stroke. Mm -hmm. But a power lifter has thick, thick, thick myocardium and that thing pumps and it it doesn't have a bigger chamber, but it it pumps with more veracity. So their ejection fraction and their heart mechanics are not that much different, even though their hearts are actually different. Mm -hmm. You know, people say, well, Lance Armstrong's heart is bigger. Well, so is Hal Higdon's and so is Jim Ryan's and all these other, you know, Prefontaine, all these guys had massive hearts. You look at their VO2 max, they were amazing. But then you look at the people who are doing the strength training. And most of those guys right now are, we're looking at the, this continuum of this longevity thing. And uh, most of the strength training people, I think, are going to win out at the end. Really? And I know you spoke with John Jaquish, and his <clears throat> whole yeah. mindset of OsteoStrong is bone health to either A, and I'm going to quote him directly, either prevent a fracture, right? Or if you do fall, I'm sorry, to prevent falling because you've got better balance and stronger bones. But if you do fall, is to prevent a fracture Mm -hmm. and reduce health care costs. And I really think that they're spot on with that mindset because they're looking at isometric exercise, which is something that most people don't think of as anything important. But they're not looking at muscle strength. They're looking at, uh, you know, osteoblast, osteoclast activity and how that can be changed over time. It's a brilliant concept. Mm -hmm. And it's not... He's an engineer, so he actually thinks about it differently. Like when I looked at medicine, and I, you know, uh, my associate Svetlana, we, we talked about medicine a lot, and I said, what this COVID crisis has done in America 
is it's, it's ripped off the, the gaping wound that is our dysfunctional healthcare system because medicine's had 100 years to get people healthy. And I believe, even though there's brilliant doctors, they failed miserably because they're not looking at what I'm looking at. I'm reverse engineering disease. And you can do that with exercise because a colleague of mine, Jason Conviser, who's one of the giants in the industry, he was a cardiac rehab guy in the 70s. And he worked with John Jaquish early on in the development of their exercise physiology protocols. And, and Jason said at a conference one time, he goes, there's not one disease in the ICD-9 coding book that cannot be prevented, mitigated, or improved by the use of exercise. And then he went down the line. What's, that co what's the coding book? What oh, the ICD-9 coding book is the International Classification of Diseases. It has over 40,000 diseases in it. But we now have the autism training specialist, the muscular dystrophy training specialist, the multiple sclerosis training specialist, the, the bone health training specialist, cancer, diabetes, uh, uh, hypertension, you know, most of the major diseases. But there are now 50, 60, 70 different types of personal trainer certifications that look at these very interesting right. problems like autism in children. Can fitness mitigate some of these symptoms? Yeah, because it's a blood flow issue. You know, can, what about muscular dystrophy? It's a neurological issue. I want to tell you a wonderful story that I think is, is the crux of what, why I'm here today. And it's not me. I'm not even going to take credit for this. <laughs> I was at the same conference that I heard John Jake was speak at and Jason Conviser. There was a gentleman named uh, Mike Albert, who was the, the general manager of the Claremont Club over here in Claremont, California, L.A. And he had a program called The Perfect Step. And it was for patients who are spinal cord injured. And their neurologists, their PTs, and their primary care docs said, you'll never walk again. So what did he do? Instead of doing PT, I asked him, I said, what's your secret sauce? Because in this talk, he said, we had 49 patients over the last eight years. 13 of them can walk. And I said, if you'll excuse my, my language, get the F out of here. There is absolutely no way that that can happen. Once the, this is what I was taught. You know, when my doctoral program was in public health, preventive medicine, it was like once the nerve is, you know, it yeah. can generate a little bit, but that's it. And I said, how did you do this? And he said, well, essentially our trainers harness clients from the ceiling, walk them on a treadmill, and literally move their feet hand to foot, hand to foot, step by step by step. I said, this has got to be the most boring personal training. Then they get them on the table, and they move them, and they move them, they de decompress, all this kind of stuff that they do. And I think what they're doing is they're regenerating the nerves at a faster rate. 13 out of 49 is almost a third. That's Nobel Prize stuff. If I were a doctor at Stanford University or NYU Medical Center and I got 13 patients to walk with a drug out of 49, I'd win the Nobel Prize. And I told him that. I said, that's Nobel Prize stuff right there. So I'm actually working with a company to try to get that data because I, I want to do a population health study on that. And, and I think that that... I'm a metabolic guy. I work with diabetes. I work with cancer, hypertension, Raynaud syndrome... Uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome, et cetera, et cetera. Here are these people working in neurology, which is something that personal trainers should not even touch. Mm -hmm. And they, they're making those kind of gains. That's the power of exercise. So, so, when you, so you went to the, this clinic, um, and, and so what impact did that have on kind of how you, you developed from there then? Well, I got, to see, I got to see fitness from a medical standpoint. I read 5,000 studies in just a few years. I became the medical exercise guy. I published in my career over 50 studies. My first, <laughs> my first medical study was published in the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology. <laughs> Don't ask me. It was on exercise and gestational diabetes. But Dr. Ivanovich published in that journal many, many times that she could get in there. It's a process. Mm -hmm. And so I published in cancer journals. I published in sports medicine journals, OBGYN, perinatology. Go figure these things. So what, what year would, it, would that have been when you... This was in the late 80s and early 90s. Okay. And I, I was very fortunate to do body comp studies. I, where I did MRI studies with uh, pregnant women. Uh, I, I, I consider <clears throat> myself to be a first in a number of things. I was the first guy to apply strength training to, to diabetes. Very first guy to apply strength training to uh, cancer. Uh, I was one of the first guys that actually did medical fitness with like Guillain-Barre syndrome and Raynaud's and nobody even know what those things are and I, I trained them. They're peripheral vascular <clears> things. <throat> and also, you know, MRI studies, I, you know, people didn't put pregnant women in MRI. I said, well, we did. <laughs> we looked at fat pads in the fetus 
in utero. It was this amazing stuff. So I was really, really lucky. So that experience allowed me to look at fitness from a medical standpoint. And that's why I'm so high on blood labs right now because yeah. we used to train diabetics and we would always do a pre and a post blood sugar, finger stick. Put it on the machine. Hey, if you're at 163, you're good to go. We're going to train you pretty hard today. But if your blood sugar is at 83, you got to have a protein bar or something and then you got to wait a little bit and then you can exercise because your blood sugar is going to dip. And mm -hmm. I, I learned the hard way. I actually had someone whose blood sugar went down to like 19 one time, which is, I mean, she was fine, but, but a doctor would have said that she would have been near death. Mm. But that's how I had to learn as a young guy doing these things, how to manipulate the work to rest ratio and the intensity of the exercise based on blood sugar. So my motto in medical fitness now is in exercise and diabetes, the training is blood sugar dependent. High blood sugars give you more latitude. Low blood sugars, you've got to do some, some intervention there. You've got to get food in there. You've got to do stretching. You've got to do yoga, whatever it is. Um, so it's given me a different perspective. And I think the blood labs, and I'm going to tell you another very interesting story. I've got lots of interesting stories here. <laughs> I have a good friend of mine who's in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And he and I have been talking about doing blood labs in the industry for a long time. His name is Jeff Foger. And this guy is a, is a, is a bulldog. He is a bulldog, and Svetlana knows him. He's just the nicest guy, but he's wanted to do, you know, he didn't, don't quit, don't quit, don't quit. And when COVID came along, he applied for some sort of project that you could be a COVID provider in what's called a high-complexity lab, which is the highest level of CLIA certification you can get. And CLIA is the, is the body that, that certifies blood labs in the United States and abroad. So he got it. So he became a, a certified blood lab, and he actually did COVID testing. And he's gotten some big contracts and whatever, but he has some colleagues that are doing what's called a breath analysis. And All I'm right. like, breath analysis? How can you get blood? Blood is, blood is blood. Or saliva testing or something of that nature. And he goes, no, no, no. He said, they're, they're using mass spectroscopy, and I, which I had heard of, but what I didn't. That? Well, a, a mass <clears throat> spectroscopy is, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm going to talk about this in terms of an MRI. You've seen an MRI scan. Well, how do you get the white for the fat, the gray for the muscle, and the black for the bone? because they all have a spectrum. Those molecules resonate at a certain spectrum. And, and when you look at the spectrum, it actually is, it's a peak in a valley. Just like if you looked at a, a sodium, potassium, whatever, they all have a peak on a spectrum. Mass spectroscopy in, in medical research is the gold standard by which all assessments are, are, are done. And the first thing that came to my mind when he started talking about this is I said, oh shit, man, this is like Theranos. You know, the lady up in Silicon Valley, who got $5 billion you know, investment money for her business. She lied to everybody. She's, she's going to go to prison, uh -huh. probably. And I'm thinking, she did finger sticks. And I said, well, everyone's been doing finger sticks. That's a, a pretty common thing. But she said you could do everything with it. And she got all this investment money, SEC filings, and all this stuff. And then it turned out she didn't do it. So the first phone call I made was to my old boss, Dr. Peterson, who's now back at Heart, Lung, Heart, Lung and Blood at the NIH. And and I said, Chuck, talk to me about mass spectroscopy. He goes, oh, Eric, we used to use that at Sansa when you were there. We did this, this, and this. And he said, oh, no, you, that's the, absolutely the best thing. I said, so, all right, so I'm going down the right path with these guys. The beauty of doing mass spectroscopy is that you can analyze it with breath. And the company in Texas that Jeff is working with has a mobile testing device. You put a tube in it. You breathe into the tube. Three minutes later, it can get a lipid panel, cardiovascular risk panel, immune system panel, uh, 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 like a CA125 uh, CA uh, anti-inflammatory panel, or a PED panel. So if you want to look at testosterone or uh, something of that nature, you can look at anything because all molecules in the body have a spectrum. Wow. And they're just converting it to milligrams per deciliter, which is what most people are used to. That is going to be the game changer in the health club industry because all my, my thought process with you is how do we get back to being an essential business through medical fitness? You're going to do it through quality training programs. These people have to be trained as cancer exercise specialists. They have to be trained in diabetes. We, they have to understand how to apply these things like high blood sugar, low blood sugar. But they also have to understand how they can do blood labs. Yeah. And blood labs is also a profit center. So the business owners, like your friends from World Gym, is like if you guys can do health fairs every month, you can do 200 blood uh, breath labs. And you can charge for them, and the insurance companies like Jason's will pay for it. Because so, it's still a blood lab. So, so from what I understand then, your background is, is really, is, has been pretty unique in, in, how, in terms of how it's combined medicine with exercise. Right. And, and you've, you've, 
you know, clearly got a lot of examples and research to support that. If you then think about where we are today, because I, I guess fitness, there's, there's many different types and styles of and, and fitness models in, um, out there. But in, in terms of what where you see, uh, or you know, how, how would you define the, the sort of fitness business? You know, is is there, you know, how, how important is it to, to combine those? Is there just um, you know, is, is there just sort of like fitness for fitness sake? Or are you saying that the, that the fitness centers in, in the future really, really need to combine this as part of what, what they're doing? Right. Well, what, one of the more interesting things that I'm seeing in the industry right now is the growth of franchises like OsteoStrong, like iCryo Labs, like um, Stretch Labs, which is growing all over California. You go in and you get stretched by somebody. It's a brilliant concept. Mm. I used to do it 35 years ago but it was part of a personal training session. And I'm watching these franchises like CrossFit was one of the the big names. And CrossFit, before Glassman left the company as CEO, he was was on the verge of trying to do this thing called CrossFit Health, which was his version of medical fitness. I don't know where it's gone because he's not the CEO anymore. But one of the things that is also a very much of interest to me because you know the fit excuse me the fitness industry is interested in profit too they want to make money not just have i mean because most medical fitness programs have not made a lot of money no they've been more of an altruistic type thing and they seem as though it's quite expensive to actually put a lot of this in um which is why the part that you mentioned about the insurance side you know if if people are going to just even to the gym and there's a there's some link to health insurance well particularly in i know in in europe it's probably slightly different but in america where it can sort of offset things, then you know, that would just seem like an obvious partnership that, right. where everybody wins, I guess. Right, and Jason is going to be, he's going to do his paperwork to be filed as a national health insurance plan by January 2022, which is perfect because that way we're getting our people. We will start to negotiate here in California with commercial health plans and Medicare Advantage, um, but we need to build a network. And that's what we're doing right now. We've got our first group. We'll have a second group. And, and, and they don't even have to come. This the other thing. They don't want to compete against each other. No, no. no you want the network to be as big as possible, like silver sneakers. The more clubs that we're involved with it, the more money they were able to, 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 to get. And that's mm. what we're going to do. We actually are going to be doing things a little bit different than silver sneakers because that's just a membership. We want to pay for medical services or fitness services like medical fitness, massage, et cetera, anything you can have in a health club. Well, if I'm a health club owner and I want to be sustainable, I want to be around for five years, what's the next big thing? I think it's precision wellness. Right. And you may not know precision wellness by name, but you certainly understand cryotherapy because they're, they're all over the place here in Southern California. Mm. And iCryo from Dallas, Texas is opening their 88th center right now. And that's a pretty tough business to be in because you've got to deal with liquid nitrogen. There's a lot of OSHA and mm. regulations you have to do. And also there's a, I guess the way that cryo has been kind of sold is it's sort of a recovery thing. But a lot of people I speak to, I like it. I, I like the, the feeling, but it, it, it's not the way it's, it's kind of been sold in my experience. It's not really... It's, it's quite loose in terms of why you'd want to go and do standing, you know, stand in a cryo booth and freeze your nuts off. <laughs> that was my thing. When my son went in there, I said, is he going to have any balls when he gets out? But, but, but here's the thing is you're right. They're, they're not positioning themselves in the right way. That's, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing now. Cryotherapy is one of the more impressive modalities, and I use the word modality because that's a therapeutic term, for muscle recovery, for fascia recovery, okay? A lot of people who have back pain over time is not because their muscles are screwed up, it's because their fascia is torn. Mm. And fascia, because it's a connective tissue like tendons and ligaments, takes a lot longer. Cryotherapy decreases that time frame. Compression sleeves are so, I mean, that the URSA conferences, I see these compression sleeves. When I went to Upgrade Labs in Santa Monica and I see they have these very fancy ones from Germany, they're, the, the research behind compression sleeves is trying to cure lymphedema. Well, lymphedema is the biggest side effect of cancer surgery. And Uh every oncologist in the country wants them to exercise because it may reduce their risk of lymphedema over time. I think that you can prevent or cure lymphedema. And I use the cure. And what is lymphedema? Lymphedema is um, when you are a woman with breast cancer and remove lymph nodes, the subaxillary lymph nodes, they'll take a number of them out. There's no transportation system there. It's a block up. It's like the 405 at rush hour. 
the, the fluid, which is the, your lymphatic fluid, is your clearing, it's your second circulatory system. It clears all of the, the crap from your cells, and you either breathe it out, pee it out, or, or, or defecate it out. And that's how it gets things through the liver, to, you know, the kidneys and stuff, for the filtration. When that system's bought black, uh, back, backed up, women will have tremendous swelling in the arm permanently. And the medical profession's viewpoint is, well, just wear a compression sleeve on your, just one of these little, like, bicycle sleeve things okay. on And that, that's going to keep it, but it's not going to cure it. You need to improve the circulation. Compression sleeves, I looked at some data from uh, the, cardio, the cardiac world, and I looked at a series of studies of, of uh, post-cabbage patients, uh, coronary artery bypass, who they looked at the, 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 the ventricles from an ultrasound, pre-cabbage, and then post-compression sleep training over three months. And the collateral circulation in the ventricular arteries went up by almost 400%. And I'm like, okay, hypertension, gone. Uh, coronary heart disease, gone. You can actually, I believe, cure coronary heart disease because you're not just working with the, co- with the coronary arteries. You're working with all the peripheral arteries. And you understand a little bit about bodybuilding, because I know you've had a lot of bodybuilders on the shows. One of the byproducts of bodybuilding is increased vascularization. You know, I remember watching uh, Franco Colombo and those. I mean, he had veins everywhere, but that happens on the inside of the body, too. And when you exercise, your heart gets collateral veins and arteries. So it becomes more pervasive. You can get more oxygen and nutrients into the systems. That's what training is all about. And that's one of those leaps right there that people in the, in the fitness world is like, yeah, the compression sleeves, Nano-V. Nano-V is, is a tube with a little cylinder, and you breathe in exclusion zone water. It's, it's like Vicks oh, Vapor Rub when I was a kid. It's a box, but what it is, it's a, it's a mitochondrial cellular repair mechanism that I believe can mitigate cancer symptoms because cancer is disrepair of, of cells and then, and then you know, rapid growth. And Cerulean Health and Wellness in Scottsdale was the first place I ever saw. I never saw Precision Wellness. I've seen a cryotherapy unit, but I've never seen all these things. I've never seen compression sleeves and PEMF, which is pulse electromagnetic frequencies. All of these things are done together. Upgrade Labs does it. Cerulean does it. Uh, there's other pla- There's a place in Minnesota that's now started. Get- these are gonna- yeah, this is going to be the next big thing. Yeah. So, so why are they so important? They're important because they, they repair the cells, they repair the fascia, they repair these types of things, they improve uh, peripheral circulation, they do all of these things, I think, better than a drug or a surgical technique, and there's no side effects. I mean, you're breathing ex- essentially water. What's that called? It's called, it, a v- it's, it's called Nano-V. That's the Nano-V. name of the, of the company. And so what, you just sit, you go in oh, like you a Oh, you sit on a chair, you sit, okay. you sit in a chair, you watch TV, and there's, <laughs> there's, it's like a little, it's, it's a box with a little... Uh, like a microphone thing, and right. you turn the water on, and it bubbles the water, and the water just comes to your nose. It doesn't smell like anything, and you just breathe it. And in Upgrade Labs, you do the, the, the PEMF and the, the Nano-V together. Right. So you're getting the pulsed electromagnetic frequencies, and they tune it to where you can actually yeah, feel the Yeah, I went the there pump. and had the, yeah. the, on my body, but I hadn't done the... Um, the, P, the, the Nano-V. The Nano-V, the Nano-V I, I think that, for, you know, like I say, what, I, my, what I'm trying to do is Mr. Let, let's marry cancer and fitness is what can you do with the nano v and the pemf well that's right. cancer and metabolic disorders what can you do for the compression sleeves well that's cancer and athletic performance and peripheral vascular disease what can you do with the cryotherapy well that's fascial care and so i'm going to try to marry all of these types of, of uh, precision wellness tools and then get them paid for on insurance so so <laughs> when, it's interesting you say that because i went down to upgrade labs and we did an interview with them and i kind of said to them i said like how do you how do you put this together? So as an example, if you went into a fitness club and you wanted a functional training area, you know, you would, it's like you'd have some kettlebells and suspension training and ropes and you kind of have this package and it would make sense and there's a general understanding of what right. you put together. When it comes to this, I, I said to them, well, you know, do you go to one company and they sort of advise you on all those bits? And they said, well, no, we just kind of tested some stuff and put together what we wanted and there's a place up up, up in uh, Costa Mesa not far from here and they've got a similar center mm-hmm. um, but again you know I, I, I don't know how you would put these packages together so I suppose if you were thinking about doing this at, at the moment it doesn't seem as though there's anyone that would kind of say well look you know in order to to do all of the things that you need to do here's you know you're going to need one of these one of these one of these and and, and this is the sort of result 
that you can actually deliver. It, it is, has, has anybody actually done that, or is that what you're trying to That's what pull I'm trying together? to do. Okay. And, and, and the last thing that, that we had talked about before we went on air was the whole thing about the software, this healthy stats. I believe that population health is, is the final key that will allow health clubs to become a provider because medicine has been able to tell you that this surgery is good, this pill is good, and this technique is good because they've published it in peer-reviewed data. And again, my experience at Sansom allowed me to learn that system. I publish one or two studies on my own every year just because I want to. But now that I'm working with Weld Health and this Healthy Stats program, we have the ability to get data on millions of people. And our first client is, is a, a company in Ohio called Maple Tree Cancer Alliance. They're the nation's top exercise and cancer company. They have 40 centers nationwide. They're going to double this year. There's another franchise. But they're going to license some of their things to the industry. They're just wonderful. And their owner, Dr. Karen Wonder, is herself a PhD and a professor and has published a number of studies in exercise and cancer. So that's part of the secret sauce. So essentially, we're, you're trying to tell me what's the secret sauce. It's outcomes data. It's population health. It's health insurance reimbursing to allow more people to get in. Right. Right. And it's, it's, tra it's a highly trained staff. And, yeah. it's, and it's the blood labs. All okay. of those things together are going to change the way the industry looks at themselves. And it's not like a manager has to know all this stuff. He can just buy some equipment, hire some good people, and my company will help with the population health and all these and the insurance things. And, and that's where we're going to build the network. That's all so, part of the network. That's, okay. what that's what I'm giving to people. So you've got so a regular fitness center, you know, mix of different people of eight, you know, some young people, some old people, so, um, and everything in between. How do you, you know, in terms of, you know, it sounds like it's a great goal, you know, it does a few things. It allows the fitness businesses that have been closed in a lot of places for a year right. to actually become essential. So whenever, you know, if anything else happens in the future, then, you know, purely from a business financial perspective, they're putting themselves in a, in a good position um, by, you know, kind of in, including this. But how, how do you sort of narrow that down? You know, because you, you've talked about cancer patients and, Diabetes and a number of other, a number of other things. There, you know, do you do you kind of hone down on one and say, well, look, this is something for for that particular demographic or those those needs, or or is it more of a kind of general health where, you know, you say to people, well, look, we, you know, we've got this program that's going to kind of just 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 general wellness program, I suppose. Right. How, how do you, how well, would you sort of think about that as a business owner in terms of where to start? As a business owner, if I had to concentrate on that one thing, and Billy Crystal said when we that one thing, it would be weight loss. Okay. Weight loss has got us into this mess. Clearly, the Krispy Kreme, I, need I say no more. <clears throat> and, but weight management through exercise and diet change is going to be our way out of it. And I, this is where I think that the health club industry is going to shine like never before because they, they, they peripherally understand weight management. There are a lot of companies that do weight management, and mm. I think they do it pretty well. I think they do it better than <clears throat> Swanson or Jenny Craig or Weight Watchers or any of these other type of eat this food in a, in a box type thing. That, I think, is part of the issue. The health and wellness industry is moving into keto diets and, and, and bulletproof coffee and all these kind of things that are really trying to maximize nutrition exposure mm. as well as the, the functional exercise versus the, 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 the strength training versus something else. So I really think that that, that one thing is weight management. I mean, okay. yes, cancer is very important. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, my passion has always been uh, what I saw with those people literally changed the way that I think of fitness because everybody told me these people shouldn't exercise. It was like they said to cardiac back in the mm -hmm. 50s. Don't, you, you've got to lay in bed until you're better. And somebody said you should get up and walk. I don't know who that person was, but it was, that was a great, really great piece of advice. And, and, and so, but weight management is going to allow people to go to a club, yeah. not a clinic. They're going to be able to, to do an exercise program, probably strength training. Someone's going to talk to them about the benefits of keto diet or paleo diet or something of that nature. But it's going to be talking about nutrient density, supplementation, et cetera, et cetera. Stop eating out of the bag, box, or whatever. Get more into this natural eating pattern. This is really where they have to go, and this is where the health clubs have to. Is it going to be more work for them? Yeah, it's not yeah, just yeah. like selling memberships. No. But if you want to do this the right way and you want to be here 20 years when all the restaurants and all of the other places are not open, the malls and all these other places, it's terrible what's happening in this country. 
but I can't save everybody. Mm. But I want to I want to work with the health and fitness industry because I believe that out of all the industries I've been in, I've been involved in higher education, I've been involved with management, I've been involved with entrepreneurship, I've been involved with a number of different things. The people that I know, and you can probably back me up on this, some of the most passionate people in the world work in the health and fitness industry. Yeah, absolutely. Some of them make really good money. Some of them don't make no. that much money, but a they lot all of them share the don't same make a passion. Lot of money in, in terms of you know, a, 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 if you own a business, probably, but a lot of the people who are working there don't. And I, I guess that comes on to a point, you know, like in, in terms of people that you know, trainers and, and that that are working, that you know, it's 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 tough for everybody at the moment. Is it, from an education perspective, then, is there a a next step where you can go from, let's say, a personal trainer and move into a, you know, more of a specialized field where you're able to kind of provide this advice? Because I guess if you're a trainer, you're not, and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but are you able to give advice on nutrition and supplementation? Um, to, to a point. Okay. You, you can't give dietetics advice. I mean, you know, the, the, the licensure laws and all these things um, are pretty strict about giving, you know, a dietary plans for health and whatever. But, but any trainer can give advice on supplementation as long as they don't do something silly like the guy at New York Sports Clubs who gave some really bad nutrition supplement advice to somebody with advanced hypertension. Mm. Of course, that person died and there was a lawsuit. But if you really look at the industry, you know, the third leading cause of premature death in the United States is medicine. It is. <laughs> Cardiovascular disease, cancer, and, and medicine, whether it's improper procedures, pharma, pharmacology, whatever. And these are the smartest people in this country. The pharmacologist, uh, pharmacist, and doctors, and all these people are the smartest, but, but medical mistakes literally kill 100,000 people a year. And, uh, and, and I think that, that and I, we're not going to talk too much about COVID, but I think that there's a lot of the, 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 the cofactors with COVID, and I think one of them with elderly is polypharmacy which oh, is taking that? a five or six, seven or eight different medications all at the same time. Oh, okay. And we don't understand the synergistic effect of those. And I think that when you take a lot of uh, any type, like antibiotics, it screws up your gut biome. Yeah. And they've got to build that up. And they don't have the opportunity to do that. They catch an infectious disease and they're gone. Right. And that's, that's the nature of the beast right there. So where's, where's the bridge between a trainer, you know, a personal mm -hmm. trainer, and then the doctor, so who's giving them the, the medicine. How, how is that gap bridge? Is it like a special person that, that, that doesn't currently exist that needs to be educated to be able to provide that advice? Or is it a specialist that just does those particular things? How, how does a, you know, I own a gym, for example. Um, I've got trainers. I like this, particularly when you're talking about the, the, the um, weight, what, what was it, how do you describe it? Weight Management. Weight, weight management, weight management, yeah, weight loss, essentially. So weight, weight loss, weight yeah. Weight so it's like, okay, I like that, and I like being mm -hmm. able to sort of add a, a, a different dimension to what we're currently doing, pure, purely exercise. How, how have I, you know, how do I think about that in terms of, the, you know, from a people perspective? Well, it's interesting because you live in a very interesting area of Los Angeles, Orange County. Everything's in Orange County. The MedFit network is in Irvine. It's right down the street from you. And Lisa Doherty, who's you know longtime friend of mine and, and really an industry bulldog, I just love her to death what she's done. She's taken the concept of medical fitness education to the next level. Mm -hmm. So your trainers and your club can be specialized. She's the person who's doing the the, the muscular. Uh, multiple sclerosis, muscular dystrophy training programs, the nutrition programs, the, the autism fitness programs, et cetera, et cetera, the post-rehab programs. All of these things have been around the industry. And, and again, I, I'm not touting my own horn. I'm just an old guy. I did fitness therapy programs in the 90s. I right. did one of the first you know, post-rehab programs in, in the 90s because I've been around for a long time. And now the American Council on Exercise, American College of Sports Medicine, um, my wonderful, wonderful friend, Andrea Leonard from the Cancer Exercise Institute, she's trained by herself. You talk about bulldogs. She's trained almost 10,000 cancer exercise trainers in the last 15 years. She is everywhere, Australia, uh, the, the mm. Far East. Uh, she's got uh, all over the United States. She, the, these, I'm telling you, the, the people I work with, the people I've known in this industry are some of the most tenacious, caring, you know, wanting to get to that next level people that I've seen, and I can compare them with other industries, and I, w I will come back to this. So those trainers that work for you will be able to do education programs based on what their, their interest is. They don't all have to work with weight management. No, but, as a, as but a, to, to simplify the, the, the model that we're talking about, mm -hmm. they could arguably go and um, get a, a qualification in this weight management, yep. which would sort of bridge that, take them yes. to a different level to where they are, um, allow them to kind of 
talk about some of these other things, like you said, like the nutrition and the mm -hmm. supplementation, for example. Right. Correct. Yes. Is, yeah. To to a, to a, to a degree. Okay. But but there, uh, you know, I, I you know. Because it seems as though these parts, like if you, you know, even as you come around here, there's all these, all these things happening in, you know, isolation. There's a clinic that does this. Yes. There's a clinic that does that. There's a, you know, all of these things seem to already be there, but they're not happening in one place as one solution, which is what we're talking about here. So how, how do you, how do you bring in those? Like diet and nutrition seems like a really obvious and essential one, you know, which which isn't being. But recommended. where do you go? Well, exactly. Right, yeah. Exactly. Do you go to the nutrition shop because there's tons of those franchises yeah. around? Do you go talk to your doctor or somebody else, and they're going to give you a specific eating plan? But again, I'm. Again, I, I I've been a little disappointed, in in you know in an industry that when you're in the hospital will give you sweets. I mean, that makes no sense to me. You just had surgery. You just had an operation, this, that, and the other thing. And they're bringing you food that, that is essentially something that you should not have been eating in the first place. So, yeah, I've heard And that they are getting better. I, and I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to diss the hospital situations because they've had enough of their own problems the last year. But it's the philosophy. It's the philosophy is of weight. And I've heard this from oncologists. Let's, let's, you know, watchful waiting. No, let's do something now. But you see, like, you know, anyone can go and listen to podcasts as an example, and, and there's, you know, you can get, I don't know whether it's official advice or whatever, but you can get advice, you can listen to, you can listen to hours for people explaining why this is what you should do and how it's been tested, etc. So right. you can just go and listen to that. And most, and if, if, you, if you've got the time, you can figure out probably a type of diet that you should do. We were talking to John yesterday um, about this, this same fact. But if you go, you know, if you go into a fitness centre, and just these basics, such as you know what, how you should structure your diet, without going into a lot of detail, um, you know how, how do you get that good, accurate advice that isn't there just to sell you a particular okay. product? I'm a trainer at your club, and somebody asked me about COVID. What should I talk to them? Well, I'm not an expert at COVID because it's an infectious disease, but I'm going to quote to them Bronstein and some of these other people who did some marvelous research this past year on the effects of high-dose vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin E, A, and zinc on mitigating COVID symptoms and said, you know, if you take vitamin C, which is one of the best antiviral vitamins that you can take over the history of mankind, you're going to be in a much better place. That one thing, that one thing, just high-dose vitamin C, three to four grams a day, you don't have to be a doctor to tell people that. It's mm -hmm. in the medical literature. I'm just telling people what somebody did with the medical literature. You don't have to take it at all. But I guarantee you that if you have any infectious disease, whether it's a sinusitis, any infection, uh, you know, something with the gut, etc., a, a common flu, any of these types of disorders, and you pump in high-dose vitamin C, you're going to mitigate that probably much faster than you would if you just try to go to work every day and drink a little water. Mm. So the trainer doesn't have to be... Over, over the top in terms of what they do. I always started with what, like I just showed you, this, the research from Bronstein and his colleagues in Detroit. It's an excellent series of papers. And, but we've been given, you know, the, 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 the advice here on the COVID is that we're only going down one way. I don't believe that. I think there's many ways to skin a cat, and I think nutrition is one of them. And I'll go back to the Krispy Kreme thing and say, this is, this is how we got to this, this place. You, you asked me, how did we get here? And I said, it's Krispy Kreme, yeah. McDonald's, uh, Dairy Queen. It, you know, uh, uh, my grandmother during World War II uh, worked in a canning factory in mid-Michigan. And she was five feet tall. She weighed about 160 pounds. She was kind of heavy set Czechoslovakian woman anyway. But every day, Brock's Candy gave them free bags for lunch because they wanted to help the war effort. Well, she gained 40 pounds, had diabetes, and died of a stroke in her 80s. So, again, how did we get here? She didn't know. She was an immigrant from, from the old country. Mm -hmm. She killed her own chickens. She ate her own eggs. She mostly did pretty good. She grew her own vegetables. She had the best compost pile I ever saw in my life. But her problem started when she was in her 30s, and she was eating over three or four years yeah. the Brock's candy. And they were only trying to help. <clears throat> yeah. You know? Yeah, that's right. So, 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 what in in terms of this? Then you've got the you've got the trainer, the sort of you know next level of trainer where they can get these certifications. They're able to provide some basic advice on diet, nutrition, and supplementation. Right. Um, which I, and and which so from a trainer perspective, I guess it, it puts them in a position where they're no longer 
a regular trainer, they're now somebody a specialist. who's a specialist, specialist yeah, yeah that's, that's also able to, to charge accordingly for that mm-hmm. level of expertise. Uh, you know, so it kind of puts, it, it allows them to differentiate themselves right. from everybody else. And then I, I suppose from a club business perspective, um, they're now also able to, I guess, get out of um, you know, just providing fitness like everybody else does and, and, and providing something that can actually, you know, they can charge for, but also can make a difference um, so there's a business commercial benefit right. of doing that. And, and I'm, I don't want to mitigate that because that, the, you know, the commercial side, when we had conversations with, with you know, the people that we're working with, they're, they're, one of the first questions is, you know, what can we make money on? And yeah, said, Well, you know, you can make money on blood labs. That's one of the mainstays of medicine. Yeah. You know, if you had a, a, a weight loss program in a medical clinic, you can't bill for the actual you know, nutrition therapy, but you can bill every week for the blood labs. So okay. They'll charge, you know, hundreds of dollars for this stuff. So, so there's, there's a number of ways to make money, but, yeah. but again, you're also, you're moving into this, this next area of, of healthcare yeah, I, as I, a provider. Right. You're not just a trainer now, you're a healthcare provider, which means you've got more responsibility. So you're going to tell your staff that, you know, this learning is not something you're just going to take one cert and then you'll be, you'll be done with it. You've got to learn about all these things. Right. So, 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 okay, I'm with you so far. Now, um, so in, in terms of where that kind of crosses over to what you're doing, so I, I guess you, we talk about like there's, there's a number of apps that are available. I, I had this conversation a, a few months ago with someone. So, you know, you've got Aura Rings and heart rate straps and a number of devices which are, which are actually, I guess, able to provide a certain amount mm-hmm. of data and information on you, which in, in a lot of cases, I suppose, if you're a trainer, you don't, you don't know, even something as simple as sleep. It's just you, not you your wedding ring? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> You, you, uh, it doubles up as that. There you um, go. But, but um, yeah, I, I guess there's a lot of devices where you can get data from, yes. and, that, and that seems to be increasing if you look at what Apple are doing and, and others, that, and, and even Amazon, you know, moving into right. this area. Right. What do you see, how do you see what's happening with these big technology companies? How does, if it, or does it link into then being able to provide information in any way to either trainers or, or fitness clubs, or, or is that not part of... Well, it, it is going to be, but, but, but fitness technologies like Apple Watch and Fitbit, and even you know, that's the next step, your Oura Ring, a, a very interesting piece of technology. But, but since the consumer doesn't know a lot about data, and I'm a Strava guy. When I ride and when I hike with my wife, we will do, I do, I put my little Strava thing on there so I can tell how fast we're walking, terrain, and all this kind of stuff, because I'm interested in that kind of stuff. But I also put it into a spreadsheet type of thing, you know, for my riding and how many, you know, whatever. But most people, when they buy a home exercise equipment or a gym membership, historically, they've quit after a few months, and now we've seen the same thing with Fitbit. I wanted to buy a Fitbit for my wife at uh, one of the tech stores, and, and the guy looked at me and goes, you don't want to do that. And I said, why not? He says, because she'll use it for a couple months, and then she won't use it again. And so I didn't buy it. But <laughs> Not a very good sales guy for Fitbit. <laughs> but, well, he tried to sell me something else. He said, he said she's going to like this better. <laughs> but anyway, but, but he, just, you know, he was trying to be honest, and I, I appreciate that with him, because I think that people, do not under, people in America don't understand data. I mean, clearly what I'm seeing with, with COVID is that, that you know, there's, there's a lot of really interesting data that people are just that's being pushed to the side. Really? You know, like I say, ivermectin. What's that? Uh, the drug that basically can, can cure COVID in four days. Hydroxychloroquine, which essentially is a, you know, it's a, these, these are anti-malaria drugs, but, but they're anti-inflammatory drugs. CBD. CBD is one of the best anti-inflammatory modal, you know, uh, tinctures that you can take. Really? Why are not people using... Uh, because one of the big things with CBD is that it, it reduces the cytokine storm within the body to almost zero. How come we're not doing CBD trials? How come we're not doing any of this stuff? This is where this is where the politics come in, and that's why mm. I have to kind of get yeah. back on track here because we could have another in, entire <laughs> talk about that. But this industry, they have in their arsenal the, 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 the exercise, and then I'll say the precision wellness that's going to be in their back pocket here soon because they're both profit centers. But the exercise is probably the most powerful tool that a person can use to change their physiology, mitigate disease, and the side effects are almost zero. If you look at how many people die in a health club every year versus how many people die in a bus, I mean, it's, it, there's no comparison. No. How many people got sick with COVID last year in a health club? Almost, it's like 0.004%. It's essentially zero. Health clubs are one of the safest places to be for COVID, mm-hmm. bar none. Absolutely, bar, mask or no mask, bar none. 
they're one of the safest places to be. That's another, that, again, that's why your doors have to remain open because mm -hmm. I'd rather have somebody in the health club that's being cleaned every three seconds than to be in some other place that, that you know, they don't really know. So yeah. anyway. But when, in terms of data then, so there are, there's a number of apps there, and you're right, I, I don't, you know, I, I can kind of figure out the data and sort of see trends and work it out myself, but I suppose if I had someone <laughs> like you that was looking at my sleep and my heart rate and a number of other things, even, even blood, which I'm going to probably have a look at then obviously someone can kind of look at that and say right here's a bit of a dashboard now this is what we need to this is what you need to do right. next well if you were training for something the data would mean more right so my father when he trained in his 40s he wanted to run a marathon and he was a short stocky guy whatever but he followed a 12-week program where he had to run this amount of miles this week a track workout here you know stretching whatever and someone laid out a program for him so he had to follow it and he did his heart rate he actually started becoming a data management guy ran a marathon he ran under four hours I mean for a guy his age and his I mean that was an amazing accomplishment mm -hmm. that he did because he actually sort of followed the data so people don't have to be data analytics people but they have to sort of take one thing. And are you familiar with heart rate variability? Yeah. Yeah. See, I, I never, I never that. knew what it was until I went to Scottsdale and, you know, spoke with the with the team from uh, from Cerulean. That's one of the most important heart measures you can ever do. And I didn't. I, I studied cardiology in my grad. <laughs> I was one of the first kids that did EKG as a graduate student back in the eighties. Nobody, they, they, they never did EKG in an exercise program. I had to do all that stuff. You know, I never knew what a heart rate variability was. What an important measurement that is, that one thing. So I keep raising my finger to you, it's that one thing. But these things are so important, and it's not very hard. But if people understand what the concept is, mm -hmm. and if your heart rate variability starts to waver, you're high, higher risk for this, higher risk for that. Well, how do you do that? Well, you learn to exercise. You can control your heart rate. You know, there are a lot of yogis out there that uh, uh, David Blaine, the magician, mm -hmm. was on a podcast and he's telling about how he held his breath for 18 minutes or something, something ungodly. I mean, Harry Houdini only did three or four minutes <laughs> back in the day. And he's telling how he got his heart rate down at one time to eight beats per minute, which I thought was physiologically impossible. I mean, the, the lowest heart rate I ever knew before that was like 28 beats a minute by Hal Higdon in the 1960s. But it's all about how you have the ability to control a lot of things in your body, your, your parasympathetic versus your sympathetic. That's what meditation is all about. That's why I think it's so important for trainers to learn all this stuff. So, what, so coming back to data then, so, how, okay. how, so what's the data, you know, what, what is it that, um, we should and can and make sense to be measuring and how does that fit as part of this whole sort of... Well, the trainers rate. are going to have to be a little bit more intuitive about data. They're going to have to not just understand what body fat is and how to do skin folds versus hydrostatic weighing or, or, or those kinds of things. You know, they're going to have to understand blood pressure and how it works with exercise. They're going to have to understand what I call the biometrics, which is heart rate variability is a biometric. But they're also going to have to understand things like the blood data and how it applies to the training. And it's not that difficult. I, I don't consider myself to be some sort of medical genius by any sense. Believe me, I'm, I, I just I like to absorb this stuff. And I also like to put the pieces together. Mm -hmm. So when the trainers learn how to do this kind of stuff, they're going to be fascinated. And, and going back to the cancer trainers, those people are some of the most passionate, evolving groups ever. I, I, I said years ago that, that, that cancer and exercise is going to be the new cardiac rehab, and it essentially is right now. There are more, can there are more people doing cancer wellness programs in health clubs and clinics all over the, the, the country uh, than, than cardiac rehab. Cardiac rehab is kind of a dying art because it was based on reimbursement and it kept getting less and less. And with Maple Tree now developing their, their licensing model, and they really are the, the top group, and Andrea doing her certifications, it's going to be a powerful tool. Mm. So the data is going to be used by them. They don't have to learn everything. No. But, but they, they need to learn. If I'm a cancer trainer, I want to know a little bit about the immune system. Right. If I'm a weight loss specialist, I want to have a lipid panel. Right. And maybe an anti, like a C-reactive protein, an anti-inflammatory. I'm just going to have to know about that stuff. And do you see that that data? Can, you know, we talked off camera about the car insurance and you know these little trackers, and it right. checks your speed and how yeah. you stop and all that. Can you see that? You know, whether it's a watch or a ring or whatever. Can you see that as well as the trainers and the clubs having and using that data for for for, for, for their needs? That that being, you know linking into the insurance where because you know anyone can say they go to the gym and right. tick the box but do you do you ever see that data kind of being like the car tracker that yeah. insurance use in 2018 
a friend of mine in New Jersey, Dr. Jay Groves, was the, the, the health director for the New Jersey Health and Wellness Group. They had about 10 medical fitness centers. And he did a, the first population health study in the industry, which I'll send you a copy of here later, where he looked at almost 400 patients, diabetes, Alzheimer's, breast cancer, back pain, et cetera, et cetera. And he did this longitudinal study on them. And across the board, they had absolutely astounding statistics. <laughs> and he actually did the same type of exercise which I thought was a little odd because I think exercise should be individualized. I think women can get just as much out of yoga as they can with a strength training program. And there's plenty of data to, plenty of data to back that up. But Dr. Groves looked at this thing, and I always tell people, I said, if you don't think that personal training can be involved in population health, read this guy's study. It's, it's outstanding. I mean, it's like 16 pages long, too. I'll give you something else I'll give you to read. But, but I, it's there. We're almost there. And the trainers didn't have to do all that work. He, he, he went to somebody from a college, which is what I do. My consulting research person is Dr. Nicole Hank from Perseverance Research in Scottsdale, and she's a clinical trials person. She helped me. You know, she is going to be my right-hand person, and I've got other people locally that I got a student from the University of Michigan on my mentorship program. All these people are going to help do this. Mm. That's what you use them for. You, you bring in all the resources and have them work this so the trainers can do what they do. They understand the data, but someone else is going to publish. We're going to, I'm going to be the new Framingham study. Do you know what Framingham is? I don't know study? what that is. Okay, so back in the 1940s, the town of Framingham, Massachusetts, did the first cardiovascular study on like 300 people. 70 years later, they've looked at almost four generations of people with cardiovascular disease. Hmm. Who got cancer? What type of exercise they do? The type of diet? The ethnics? The everything? They, they 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 put everything in the soup can, and it is the largest population health study in the history of the United wow. States. It's amazing, and there's a little bit of exercise in there too. But there must be a lot of I, I guess compared. Like I, I met the guys from Tonal a little while back, and you know they just a simple strength machine, um, very clever. But <laughs> what they're building up is is all of this user data because the people are using the, right. the machines and putting in their personal information. Right. So they've, they've almost got the equivalent of a, an ongoing study on st strength training, which they're, they're you know, I, I, I don't quote me exactly, but they, you know, we, we were having this conversation about, well, look, that's quite powerful in itself to be able to use for something. And I, and, and I suppose in terms of what you're talking about here, you, you know, if, and if you, if you sort of keep with me in terms of where I'm going, so if... You know, if you've got the trainers, you've got the clubs, um, you've got this weight management, and then you've got this data in terms of how, what you're prescribing and the results that you're getting. Um, you know, my guess is that that's quite powerful. One, in terms of going to insurance or anybody to yeah. be able to demonstrate, look, what we're doing is making a difference. From a business perspective, you've suddenly now got great case studies to say, look, you know, this, this is not just me doing a testimonial with Mrs. Smith. This is, you know, I've got some hard right. data to support the results that you're actually going to get if you're, you're part of that. But I, I just wondered how you kind of connect all of those data points into something that can actually be used in that right. way. Right. Well, the, the trainers will use the Healthy Stats and what's, outcome We've software. not talked about that. Well, the Healthy, healthy stats, stats is my collaboration with Weld Health in Virginia. And for years, I tried to put together all of the stuff that I knew about clinical outcomes with hypertension, diabetes, prenatal, postpartum, senior fitness, back pain, et cetera, et cetera. So what are the outcomes you're looking for? Well, in hypertension, the most important outcome you're looking for is blood pressure. It ain't that hard, Matthew. You measure the blood pressure before you exercise. You measure the blood pressure in between some stations, and you measure the blood pressure when they're done. Diabetes is blood sugar dependent. We've said that. You measure the blood sugar before you change your intensity and duration, and you measure it afterwards. That was the crux of my entire work at Sansom Research was pre and post blood sugars in GDM, gestational diabetes, and in type 1 and type 2. That got us into those medical journals because nobody had ever seen this because when you lower the acute blood sugars, you also lower what's called the glycosylated hemoglobin or the A1C, which is the measurement of long-term blood sugar. And if a diabetic person can be under 6.5% A1C, they have a normal range of their blood sugars. If their A1C gets up to 17%, they're going to have eye disease, mm. kidney disease, peripheral vascular disease. That's where those complications start because the, the blood sugars have become unchecked for so long. A1C is a long-term measure of blood sugar. Every trainer should know what an A1C is. Every trainer who works with, blood, with hypertension should know how to use a, a blood pressure cuff. Every trainer who works with cancer should understand 
range of motion limitations with a woman who's got lymphedema or surgery or she's had a, a trans flap or any of these other types. They should know those things and Andrea does an amazing job of teaching them. It's out there. The data, the information is there. That's how they look at the data. Right. When I did my cancer program, I found a, a survey called the Rotterdam Survey. It's a very classic, you know, the fact scale and all these things are a part of cancer treatment, but they're more behavioral health. And I thought, well, why don't I have these guys fill it out at the end of their 10-week exercise program? Bada bing, bada boom. I have this really great data from a, from a, from a validated cancer behavioral assessment tool that I applied to an exercise program, and I published it in journals. People would look at me and they said, this is really impressive stuff. And it's like, you just have to put the pieces together, mm. you know? So trainers don't have to be hematologists, but they have to understand blood labs. They, and that's you know, the healthy stats then. That. Well, the healthy stats does all that for you because right. the, 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 you can put the assessment data in, the blood data in. Mm -hmm. So let's say the person has blood data. So the first day you'll plug in a bunch of things. And then every day that they come in for training, what intensity do they do? High, medium, low. So that today they're doing a medium. Well, what's the, what's the, uh, the duration? Are they doing 5 to 10 minutes, 10 to 15, 15 to 20? Oh, 15 to 20. So I plug that in. And what's it, like an app or it's something? It's just an app or okay. the, the software. You just tap, tap, right. tap, tap. And every session you tap about six things. It takes about 30 seconds per, per patient. And that's it. And, but it also has the, with, I, I'm, I'm not a tech guy, that has the interface. So if you have a nutrition program, it can interface all that nutrition data mm -hmm. that goes into healthy stats. And who, get, who's, who, has that, who owns that data then? Is that the... That's the most amazing question that you may have <laughs> asked me today. Who owns the data? I'm a part owner of the data because of my relationship with the company. But when, a, when, when another company like Maple Tree wants to interface their data, we all own the data. Mm -hmm. So I have to be very careful with Maple Tree because it's clearly their data that's interfaced. We just have, and then you have to figure out what do you do for the, the, the patient slash client. Well, they just signed a release form that says we can use unidentifiable data. We don't know mm -hmm. their name or any of that stuff, but all of the other things. That's the important stuff. Yeah. I don't care if Matthew has got hypertension. I want to know if there's this 38-year-old guy. You know what I mean? I want to know the data. I want to understand what the blood labs and all those things are. Those are the trends I want to follow right. over time. So it sounds, so in terms of the... You know, coming back to the beginning, because I know we're, we're sort of slightly running out of time. Um, okay, we, can, we can have part <laughs> two and three of this one, I think. But um, so, so in terms of making gyms a centre of them, really it's, it's kind of moving beyond just like regular exercise and, and, and sort of having these kind of super trainers and, and super facilities. I made up that name, but so, yeah. sounds good. It sounds good. <laughs> Where, you know, from a business perspective... You know, you, you're able to sort of, you know, we, we, we're coming away from this sort of like, you know, almost devaluing the fitness side, you know, in, in, instead of it being a commodity, it's now something that there's a value and people are, can invest in, whether that's because of the benefits of the insurance component, which seems as though that, you know, at some point is going to come together, mm -hmm. um, uh, or whether it's a case of just being able to sort of charge for a service, which other, other businesses are actually charging, you know, Paying, you know, if, if I want to go and do this, I can do it now, right. but I wouldn't go to a fitness center. I'd pay for a specialist, and you'd probably pay a lot of money for that if you went I don't know to how it. much a person pays for Weight Watchers or Jenny Craig, but, they're, you know, it's a significant a few hundred dollars a month, I would say. Yeah. Why wouldn't you not do that with a club yeah. that, that actually had the data, the training, the specialist, and the facilities that can get you there as quick? Now, I know that exercise in and of itself is not the beat-all and end-all for weight loss. It's a lifestyle change. We get that. But where we are as a nation right now, we're, we are at a tipping point. Mm. I mean, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Malcolm Gladwell. We are, we are in a not a very good place here at all. Mm. If we're relying on one thing, which is a vaccine, and I'm not going to debate the merits of it, but there's other things that you can use. If you're going to only use this versus lifestyle, this won't work as well. Mm. I think that something like a pill... Um, uh, one of the things that we used to pride ourselves on at Sansom is that could we get a type 1 diabetic to reduce their insulin regime by a third of uh, a, a 30%, which means instead of taking three shots a day, they only had to take two. <laughs> over, the, over a year, that's a lot of insulin yeah. that you're not using. And we actually have the data to make that, to, to make that up. And the uh, sulfonylureas, the oral agents for diabetes, we've got people completely off sulfonylureas. Wow. This data has been out for 30 years, Matthew. This is, I'm not telling you like this mysticism from Eric. Claudia Graham, who went, did her doctoral dissertation at USC back in 1989, published a paper in Diabetes Care Journal, the top journal in diabetes, 
on the effects of a regular exercise program in reversing diabetic complications and across the board, nephropathy, eye disease, neuropathy, microvascular disease, they all reversed. But this is 30 years ago. Every health club person should know this. Mm. And I guess it's putting that, you know, you know this, coming back to this data thing, I guess it's being able to demonstrate, because probably a lot of this is actually happening in, in you know, businesses around, but it's, mm-hmm. it's not, you know, it's how, how it's packaged and represented, um, which I guess, you know, probably we're not doing a fantastic job at doing that, hence why a lot of these businesses are closed down. Final question, because I know we, we, we are um, cutting into the time. That's all right. Okay. But I guess the, the, other, the other thing I'll be interested in your view is, you know, we still, as, a, as an industry, we're still tapping into a really small percentage of, of the yes. population that, we've, that, that we could be tapping into. Um, with this sort of hybrid concept that, that we've been discussing here, you know, do you see that as a way of, of the people that are not just interested in the six pack and the, and the biceps? Do you think it's <laughs> the buns of steel? <laughs> <laughs> it's an opportunity. Not to that kind there's of, anything wrong. That, that's no, a fantastic. Absolutely, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah uh, anyway, I love the whole, I, you know, uh, but anyway, but, 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 you know, is it a chance of turning that 20 into a 30 or a 40 by kind of, you know, positioning things slightly differently? Yeah. Paul Zane Pilzer is an economist, yeah. and he wrote the book The Wellness book, Revolution, yeah. which I read in 2003 or 2004. <laughs> I said, well, this guy's on the right path. But he said, he said to the industry when he gave a keynote at URSA, he said, you know, you people are worried about nonprofits stealing your money. So you've got 80% of the population that doesn't use your health facilities. You really need to be going after those people. He goes, I'm not a doctor. I'm an economist. <laughs> you know, this makes good finance. Now we're at the crossroads. And I know that there have been some clubs that have really done a great job with yeah. this. The cancer programs, the, the diabetes, I mean, they're in there. Mm-hmm. But again, they haven't put all the pieces of the puzzle, whether they're, they're not doing the outcomes, they're not looking at reimbursement, they're not doing other types of things. They need to be doing pretty much all of them. And, but now they're at this crossroads. I don't want to close my doors. Yeah. And how many, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, how many, uh, who, who filed for bankruptcy? 24 hours? I, I, there's a, there's a lot. There's I think a lot you were talking filing. about, what is it, 30% of Yeah, 30, of 35, over 35% closed. of health clubs, according to URSA last week, uh, closed it for some length of time, and they laid off a million workers. That's a terrible statistic. My heart mm-hmm. breaks for those people because the people at the Claremont Club, they, were, they did outstanding work. I mean, mm. I mean, just Denise Johnson and all those people, they were just marvelous. The people at the Marsh, the people at all of these the upgrade labs, those people, they just, I'm telling you, they did outstanding work. What those kids learned and knew at upgrade labs, yeah. it blew my mind. Yeah. And I've been around the block, Matthew. I've read 10,000 research studies. I, you know, I've, I, I try to pride myself on international research and all these kind of, I get, you know, I, this is like my bag. This is mm-hmm. one of the things that I dig is how do I get research and how do I actually apply it? Yeah, particularly when, you know, when listening to you here and, you know, many people have said it, it's particularly when like really this is, as you said, this should have been one of the things that did stay open to kind of improve this situation. So I, I, I right. you know. Well, if, if I were a marketing guy in, in, in the industry, I would write, and actually, my partner Cosmo has already done this. He's written, like, the, the stay open plan for health clubs. We need to market that to every public health entity in the United States. Yeah. Every public health agency needs to get a report. Mm-hmm. And there's a public health uh, association. I know I've gotten information from them. They need to understand what the industry is doing. Mm. Because legally, which is a totally another thing, do they even have the, uh, do they even have the, 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 the authority to do that? I don't think that they did. But I've known some people around here that have not done exactly what you've done, but they've included some of these complementary services, and they've allowed yeah. them to stay well, I have open. A, I have a colleague, Chris Couturia, up in uh, Morro Bay, California, and this guy is a 40-year health club guy, and he has a, he has a hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So he, he, uses, he uses ozone and, and oh, okay. HBOT and whatever, and he's had this little tiny studio. And, he just, and I said, well, how come you didn't close your doors? And he looked at me and he goes, because I decided I didn't want to. Of course, he was in a medical building, so that, that was very yeah. helpful. But there are people who just decided they weren't going to close. They just kept their doors open the whole time. Yeah. But they were still afraid of somebody coming in. And I just don't think that's right. No. Anyway, that, that's a legal question we want to talk so, about. So, look, if it, there's a lot we've covered here. Yeah. Hopefully it's given some people some, you know, a few ideas about, um, you know, what options there are. You know, certainly it's seen from a business 
person's perspective, it seems quite exciting. Um, you know, there's all this sort of, you know, blue ocean out there, really, yeah. that, that we're probably not considering. For people who want to, are interested in kind of, you know, having a conversation with you, learning more, thinking about how maybe, you know, how to navigate th- th- this as, as a, um, you know, op- opportunity, how do they get in touch with you and what, what, what are some of the services that you're offering? Well, the fitness initiative, fitness is medicine initiative is my partnership with my friend Cosmo. The blood lab is my partnership with Jeff. Uh, my business is really moving in, in, in a number of different directions uh, with, with my crew, the, the, you know, the outcomes and all the other things that I'm doing, my relationship with Weld Health, all of these pieces now are starting to fit into place. But if people want to, to talk with me a little bit more about it, they, they can reach me at, me, at medhealthfit.com, which has it's been my website for you know, almost 27 years. And um, they can just call me, you know, my 805-451-8072 number. <laughs> uh, anybody can call. I'll just take a message. But, but you know, uh, they can get my email and all that stuff. And we'll put website. some of those in the yeah. notes and the emails. Right. And, I, and like I say, I just, I, I, you know, in 30 years, I've just, you know, I have a good friend of mine in Santa Barbara who's my financial advisor. And his, 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 his one word of advice to his one phrase is just stay the course. And he's been telling me that for years, and I think now I'm at the precipice. And it really, like you say, is really exciting yeah. because I think that health club owners now have to make a decision. Do I close my doors or do I sort of change things? World Gym and some of these other groups have made, I think, a spectacular decision. And the precision wellness, all these other things are going to sort of fall in line, not just as profit centers, but things that I believe precision wellness can cure many types of disease. And Dr. Hank actually cured Alzheimer's disease using uh, a Nano-V and keto diet. I said, how can you do this? I'll give you that study as well. And these things are amazing. It's all, the data's there. It's just that people, you know, and I, maybe that's what I'm going to be good at is helping people navigate some of this stuff because medicine is complicated. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I want to try to uncomplicate it as much as possible because I want for the industry to thrive in the next two years. I don't want them to be shut down because there's a COVID-73. Yeah. There's, def- there's definitely a, a, a missing part. There's a bridge that I think, you know, the health and fitness industry can provide towards, you know, you've got medicine over here and you've got fitness over here. Mm-hmm. No connection. Um, you know, people don't even draw the natural conclusion between the two. But it seems, you know, something in the middle is, is required. Um, but if you, can, if you can get a blood pressure cuff on Amazon or if you can get a freestyle Libre, which is the, the non-invasive blood sugar. You put a patch on and you right. swipe it with your phone and it gives your blood sugar. You can do it with a marathon. That's utilizing that medical technology to your advantage. Lactate meters, you know what I mean? That people get their lactate when they're doing intervals. I mean, this is really important stuff. So use that medical technology because it is, it is powerful information. Mm. You just have to kind of figure out how you're going. No, people in daily life shouldn't use lactate testing. They don't know what it's about. But Lance Armstrong used to use it every time he did hill repeats. Mm-hmm. And he, he would say, okay, you've got to do a little bit more, not just based on your time, but based on your lactate threshold. Mm-hmm. So the data's there. The information is there. It's how I, I'm trying to sort of Package make, it make the cookie a dough a little yeah. bit more there's palatable a, for people. Yeah, so, there's, a, there's yeah. quite a bit of yeah. putting it together. So, Eric, thank you very much. One last question for yes. you. Um, Escape Your Limits is about escaping what you've believed is impossible and made it possible. What would be um, a memorable example of escaping your own personal limits? It's funny you should ask because in your gift bag behind you is a book called 98 Miles High. I I got into the whole Lance Armstrong thing. And I live in Santa Barbara, and I live less than 1.5 miles from Old San Marcos, which is uh, an alpine climb that the U.S. Postal Service used to use every year. Gibraltar Road was the site of the Tour of California hill climb and the U.S. Hill Climb Championships, one of the toughest hill climbs in the United States, and that includes Colorado and all these other places. And I read an article in Bicycling Magazine about some guy who climbed over 450,000 vertical feet in one year. And I said to myself... Well, I can do that. I was 43 years old. I had no idea. But I set a goal to climb over half a million vertical feet on my bicycle. So I did, you know, how I got, you know, the, the percent grade and all the other stuff and how many vertical feet I had to climb every week. And I think I did 515 or 520,000 vertical feet in 12 months. And then I found other people who were doing it, you know, now that Strava, you can see there are people who are doing like 1.8 million vertical feet wow. a year. But I set this goal for myself. And it was a hard goal. 
it was I lost 10 pounds. I, I, came, I came down with this condition called reactive hypotension where I'd get up too fast and I'd feel like I was going to faint because I was so dilated all the time from climbing. Climbing is hard. Climbing is one of those things where you climb for 30 minutes, an hour, or whatever, and you don't, you don't rest. You're at almost anaerobic threshold the entire time. But it was so fun to do, Matthew. It was such an adventure. It was such an adventure. And there's a little book in there for you. Fantastic. So anyway. Well, Eric, thank you so much. Appreciate it. It's uh, been really, uh, really enjoyable. And uh, yeah, like I say, I would recommend um, if anyone's interested uh, having a conversation. I'm more with than you. happy because, like I say, I think we're going to have more and more people that are just going to be walking down this road. And I'm happy to take their hand because I, I think that this is a. It's a good thing to do. Yeah, it's going to be a. a it's got my win. mind thinking. Maybe I yeah. should have a nice gym here on the on the beach with a medical fitness. <laughs> so if you've got any investors and you want to come up with a new concept, then. <laughs> well, anyway, thanks again for having yeah. me. I really appreciate it. All Thank right. you very much. Bye. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you did, then please go over to iTunes and subscribe to the Escape Your Limits podcast. Leave a review, leave a comment. It really would help us a lot to continue to keep these going.